say over with the backlog to be produced. Let me do that now. I'll do a quick uh, 10 minute uh, overview of the chapter. And in the remaining time of the, this uh, virtual class session, what I want to do is um, uh, do a quick, uh, I keep saying quick, do an uh, introductory lecture for quantum mechanics. Because uh, this is my belief that quantum mechanics does not need to be mysterious. There are some new things you need to learn in quantum mechanics that reveals a very unintuitive aspect of nature. It's something that we would have never guessed except for the experiments that reveal them. So there are those um, surprising aspects of quantum mechanics, but once you, um, once you accept those surprising aspects, then the rest of the quantum mechanics is quite um, explainable with all the concepts you learned in this class and uh, it, uh, all the mysticism around the quantum mechanics that you sometimes see in popular media, it's not necessary. So that's my goal. So let me get started with that. Um, so I will guess I'll start with uh, the overview video. I'm hoping to keep it to 10 minutes, um, I guess without any benefit of the editing. So you can um, access all the uh, uh, textbook chapters through this overview um, uh, overview page and um, um, so let me just start out with the beginning of the chapter so chapter 13 begins the unit 4 modern physics this is really what we have been working towards to this entire semester it's uh, um, this, this was our goal, whether you <laughs> do it or not. The, um, this is why, uh, the, uh, I guess uh, I'm saying this to kind of excuse uh, why the pace of the course seemed so hurried in the first 12 uh, weeks or so. It's so that we could get to this chapter with uh, a bit of uh, time remaining, uh, three to four weeks, where you can learn about this um, really the interesting part of physics. You have the benefit of kind of skipping to this when you're taking chemistry or so uh, we are here now. And uh, so chapter 13 begins unit for modern physics, which will cover all the surprising aspects of physics that we physics physicists learned only around the turn of the century, turn of the 18th, sorry, 19th to 20th century around the 1900s. So um, the chapter it has seven sections. They are all important. <laughs> the first two, two sections talking about black body radiation and the photoelectric effect will go over experimental beginning of quantum mechanics. Uh, as I was saying, really there are um, there are a couple fundamental starting places in quantum mechanics where. Uh, you need to learn a new fact of nature that we just sitting in our chair thinking about how universe should be would have never guessed. This is uh, quantum mechanics um, is a discipline within physics that has a distinctly experimental origin. And these first two sections will describe those experiments which led people into accepting the quantum nature of, I guess, nature. <laughs> and we'll get to that. And uh, section 13.3 uh, is uh, starts to refine those realizations that people had. And this is where we begin to describe the a dual nature. Um, we call it uh, particle wave duality. And we'll, st we'll start to have a firmer theoretical ground in the third section. And uncertainty principle is the one where, when I talk about mysticism around quantum mechanics, I think uh, mostly it's around the uncertainty principle. And I think it should be more straightforward. I'll try to get to some of that both in this overview video and when later on when I um, do a longer introduction to quantum mechanics with the help of simulations. And um, these two sections 13.5 uh, and 13.6 um, covers I guess the connection to something that you might have learned in chemistry or you will learn in chemistry and these all connect to the quantum nature that uh, we covered earlier. And the uh, uh, 
section 13.7 is um, kind of tying um, all these together. So uh, I guess I should uh, point out some key figures and equations that I hope you will take a look at uh, in more detail as you're going through the chapter reading. So in black body radiation, the kind of key figure that uh, illustrates what it's getting at, what it's trying to illustrate is this figure here. The figure of what we call black body spectrum. And um, let's see, how do I describe this? So I think when we covered chapter 12, I said it comes at a, a very appropriate place, uh, the connection between the classical physics, um, uh, classical physics and the modern physics. It's because it's really the study of light that revealed these uh, aspects of modern physics, quantum mechanics. So this, uh, uh, on the x-axis, it's uh, illustrating the electromagnetic wave spectra. Here's the visible range. And that visible range extent, well, the, the, the electromagnetic wave spectrum extends beyond the visible range. Uh, at longer wavelength, you have infrared and then radio frequency and micro or sorry microwave and then radio frequency. I think it, all this is actually still infrared. <laughs> um, and then the hot, the shorter wavelength range, you have the ultraviolet, X-rays, and all the dangerous stuff that we'll talk about more in chapter fifteen. So, what it's describing here is 3000 Kelvin might describe electromagnetic radiation emitted by a light bulb. So you see that a light bulb emits electromagnetic radiation, some portion in the visible range. That's why it's useful as a light bulb. And a greater portion in the infrared that kind of reflects the fact that light bulb is hot. It usually we, we feel infrared as a heat. Um, so this is a, uh, so this red curve is showing an ex experimental curve. And as you get to higher temperatures, this 5,000 Kelvin is clo closer to the temperature of the sun. So it has a maximum around the green color where you get the maximum amount of light from the sun. And it, uh, so this blue curve is showing what is experimentally true. And around the turn of the century, 1900s is when uh, the, the theory of physics, thermodynamics and electromagnetism developed enough that scientists, physicists could try to describe this experimental curve theoretically. And they just utterly failed. That's what's known as ultraviolet catastrophe. This classical theory curve, this black curve, is what classical theory predicts for the light from the sun. It predicts that we should have a ton of X-ray that would kill us, <laughs> or ultraviolet light that would also kill us. So this is what's referred to as ultraviolet catastrophe. And this is where you see the beginning of quantum mechanics in trying to reconcile this difference between the classical theory and the experimental result is where a German physicist named Max Planck came up with his law, Planck law. And in the process of coming up with the Planck law, he had to introduce this new constant that we now call Planck's constant. And this is the fundamental constant of nature. So, so if we, we wanted to encapsulate everything about quantum mechanics in one number, that's this number, Planck's constant. So, okay, I need to go faster. Uh, sorry, I already used, what, six minutes of my 10 minutes? <laughs> okay, let me go faster. So, um, so this discovery by Planck is really the biggest initial step. And what we find is that uh, Planck uh, didn't go far enough. He's introducing this um, kind of hypothesis that these oscillators could emit light only in this discrete unit or um, have 
energy change only in these discrete units. That itself was a bit of a revolutionary assumption that wasn't justified in any previously known physics. And the surprising thing is that uh, Planck should have gone farther than he actually did. And that's where um, the photoelectric effect comes in. You have an essay assignment connected with this. This is the work in um, which earned Einstein his Nobel Prize. Not the experimental work. This uh, experimental feature of photoelectric effect has been known for a very long time. And in the chapter, you will read about what were some features of this uh, photoelectric effect that was baffling to, uh, to classical physicists and what additional assumption that Einstein made to explain the photoelectric effect. And this will look very familiar because it's a, mathematically, it's the same expression that you have seen Max Planck use. What is radically different here is the interpretation you attach to it. Um, so you will read about all of that in the chapter. I'll just leave that there. And the surprising thing from here on is that Einstein actually didn't go far enough. He attached this um, new property of light to just the light. And the next advancement in quantum mechanics came from supposing that this relationship was not a relationship unique to light, but it's a relationship that held for everything in nature. That's what the next section gets at, and that's uh, what begins the more theoretical grounding of uh, quantum mechanics. We, um, so if we call it De Broglie. Uh, by the way, I can never pronounce this name right. It might be De Broglie or it might be De Broglie. I think I just say De Broglie because it's easier. So <laughs> there's a, a, what we now call De Broglie hypothesis, which uh, can be um, expressed in this form. And uh, for photons, you can show that this is consistent with the relationship that Einstein came up with for photons earlier. And you can uh, I read a paragraph. And what I want to emphasize here is that this is your gateway. This is your door between quantum mechanics and classical physics. Everything on the right hand side is something that you can understand from classical physics, for example. A P it stands for momentum. Hopefully you remember the um, hopefully you remember what we talked about for momentum. Sorry, I need to be able to draw here. <laughs> um, so uh, in unit two, so many weeks ago, we introduced the idea of momentum. We usually use letter P, don't ask me why. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. They are actually vector quantities. Um, so this, uh, hopefully you remember from unit two, when we talked about energy and momentum. And so this is a property that you can attach to anything that has mass. So imagine, uh, where's my balls? Um, imagine a particle that has some mass. So <laughs> there it is. Imagine that moving at some speed v. Then, uh, so with that object, you can associate a momentum, p. Now, in classical physics, if I had asked, if I have given you a particle of mass m moving at speed v and asked you what is its wavelength, you would look at me strange because it's a particle, it doesn't have a wavelength. And what De Broglie relationship, what De Broglie hypothesis is telling you, it's a new quantum mechanical fact that you are being asked to accept, is that this particle moving at some speed v, having some momentum p, has it, it has a wavelength and we can associate the wavelength to that momentum through this relationship. Wavelength, that wavelength is given by Planck's constant divided by momentum, which will give you the correct units. That will give you the unit of uh, length as you all see. And, um, 
and um, and this is what I mean. It's the gateway between the classical description of an object and the quantum mechanical, wave mechanical description of the same object, which apparently has a wave nature that we would have never guessed. Now, for most macroscopic objects, this wave, wave wavelength turns out to be microscopic. So it's uh, impossible to measure. It's not something that you would uh, Manifest, you would see manifest itself. This uh, wavelength becomes uh, significant enough for us to measure for microscopic object, which has a small enough mass that, yeah, I think that's what the chapter is getting. So read the chapter, please. So um, the rest of the chapter, which uh, I guess I'll just briefly go over, uh, goes through the implications of what's introduced in section 13.3 that wave nature implies um, an uncertainty principle. I think this is uh, easy to illustrate in a, a FET simulation, so let me do that. Uh, um, here, you know, read the chapter, uh, look at what's there. And in, a bit of, in about five minutes, I will show you demonstrating uh, uh, simulation what we mean by this uncertainty. This uncertainty, uh, we call it Heisenberg uncertainty principle it uh, puts a constraining relationship between two things, um, uncertainty in position and uncertainty in momentum. And it says that these two uncertainties are related to each other in such a way that there's a minimum possible value. That in classical mechanics, we would say, in theory, these could be as precise, it could be arbitrarily precise. It's a matter of coming up with the right experimental methods, good enough experimental tools. That's what classical theory would have had you assume. What we admit in quantum mechanics is that there is a fundamental limit. No matter how good our instruments are, no matter how good our experimental setup is, there is a fundamental theoretical limit to how precise these two measurements can be simultaneously, and that's expressed in Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it comes from the wave nature of nature, uh, what we talked about in 13.3. Um, and 13.5 uh, and 6, let me um, demonstrate that in the, uh, with another simulation. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave that there. Read through that for the interesting historical description. Uh, I, Love the history there, but I'm already five minutes over what I said I would spend. So, um, um, yeah, so 13.6. I'll also demonstrate this in a simulation. I think that'll be the best. Um, one uh, nice kind of thing that ties off everything here is that in Bohr's uh, theory of hydrogen, he makes this almost a crazy assumption. And by the way, this is why um, I made so much effort to make sure that we cover angular momentum, is that this angular momentum plays a very important role in quantum mechanics. So when you get to this point, I want you to have some sense of what angular momentum meant in classical mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, there is a similar quantity that plays almost, almost identical role to classical angular momentum. And what the quantum mechanical feature of this angular momentum is that it's uh, quantized. It comes in discrete units. So it comes in units of what we call H bar, or Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. It, uh, Bohr just assumed that that might be the case, and he got all the right results. And um, if you just look at it that way, it's a kind of yet another, I guess, a third or fourth, depending on how you're counting, one, two, three, four. Fourth, unjustified assumption. Unjustified other than the fact that it gives correct experimental result. And this is what I mean. It's the section 13.7, which will kind of help uh, tie all these things together in that um, you can connect what we had in 13.3 we do what we had at 13.6. We can say that, oh, maybe, um, so you saw standing waves when we covered the waves. You saw the distinctive features 
it's, uh, um, you know, standing waves are very important in classical mechanics. That's what describes resonance and all the stuff. So uh, it's not too uh, much of a stretch to imagine that stand, once we, you are dealing with the waves, quantum mechanical waves, the standing waves are somehow, again, important. So um, now if we were to assume that the electron in orbit maybe uh, should have formed some kind of a standing wave, then you can kind of explain Bohr's uh, strange assumption. And, um, and this is as correct as far as early thinking goes. I don't want to kind of just leave it here because, uh, let's see, do I bring this in? Uh, okay, I guess I'll have to leave this up to chemistry. So this description of the electron orbit is, it's the early thinking. Uh, what we think about electron orbits in hydrogen atom, it's a very different now. It's, uh, um, it, for one, they don't actually have orbits. In chemistry, you hear about orbitals. And um, there are some associations you can make, but what I would uh, leave you with is that these are models. I hope they help you connect to physical quantities. But one thing about physical models is that um, they are a tool for us, a, a, a tool of a way for us to get our grip on the really abstract, difficult ideas in modern physics. Uh, they all have a kind of a breaking point. Uh, there's a such thing as stretching the model out too far and beyond that point, the model doesn't quite apply anymore. This is uh, that kind of a model. And um, for those of you who might end up at majoring in physics, what you will see is that um, what you will see is that the, it really takes um, uh, advanced uh, mathematics, differential equations, to fully correctly describe something as simple as a hydrogen atom. So uh, that's uh, the kind of uh, overview. Um, oh, I guess there's no chapter review. So uh, in terms of the equations, um, I, the, so one single number that's the most important in this entire chapter 13, as I was saying earlier, is Planck's constant. This is the one most important number in all of quantum mechanics, now and forever. <laughs> so please um, um, learn its importance. Oh, by the way, I think as of this year, uh, um, this number is determined, um, it, it's defined to be a precise value. Um, so there's that. <laughs> and uh, if I guess if I were to pick one single equation that uh, most important thing to understand, I would have go to section 13.3, the De Broglie relationship. This is the single most important relationship. All the other relationships, you can kind of get to it, start using this as a starting point. So once again, this is your gateway between the classical physics and the quantum mechanics. All right, so, sorry, that was a long overview, about 20 minutes, uh, I guess, um, I, I don't know, I, I was hoping this would be something I can edit down and use for later. I'll look at it later. 